Namaskar and uh, welcome to Indian Diplomacy, show on national television to engage audiences about uh, India's foreign policy, the way India engages with the important partners around the world, India's impact on the global scene, and also the kind of issues and problems that arise in the international community with, to which India contributes uh, solutions. Viewers, this episode, we are looking at uh, the whole phenomenon of uh, India's independent foreign policy. India has been an autonomous player on the world stage for a long time. It has a reputation for making up its mind and uh, making its choices and votes uh, in its own independent fashion without uh, falling under the pressure of any uh, power block. Uh, and uh, to explain this phenomenon and its all its manifestations and how it actually plays out in world fora, I have a very special guest with me today, Ambassador Anil Trigunayath. Thank ambassador you. Trigunayath uh, has been India's ambassador to Libya and Jordan. He was also deputy chief of mission uh, to Russia. And he is a distinguished fellow at an uh, important think tank of the country, Vivekananda International Foundation. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, for being with me. Thank you, Professor Chalia. It's such a pleasure always to be with you. Ambassador Trigunayath, when we talk about India's stature, it has been rising in recent years, especially in international fora like the United Nations. We got 184 out of 192 votes uh, to become um, to get the non-permanent seat in the Security Council and we have uh, conducted ourselves very honorably and with distinction this two-year term uh, in the Security Council. We have huge uh, backing in the UN General Assembly also and all of this is in some way or the other linked to this theme of the show which is the independent mind and approach and attitude that we bring to world affairs. So, uh, to begin with, why, ha why has India always been like this? I mean, why are we not amenable to <coughs> being bent uh, to the will of this side or that side? And uh, why do we continue to have that streak of, uh, uh, you know, acting freely uh, without uh, favor or fear in our own national interest, but also in the well-being of the global good? Well, I think that uh, we have had uh, quite a terrible experience during the colonial era. Mm. And therefore, when India became independent after the Second World War, obviously we had to look at what will serve our interest the best. And the world got divided into these two power blocks, which had their own agendas, basically trying to balance the world powers. But in India in that time, along with large number of developing countries and seeing that our world was still thoroughly colonized, India took up the cause of the developing world. And since then, we have continued to stand for the developing world. Secondly, we also look at the whole world in the Vasudev Kutumkam mm. philosophy. So whenever you are looking at from that point of view, uh, it does not fit into the block power politics, very simply put. Mm. And thirdly, I think is the most important thing for India when it's driving its foreign policy, and every foreign policy tries to do that, is to subserve what is India's national interest. Mm -hmm. Now, when I say national interest, it is not parochial kind of a national interest. It is an interest which is self, it's an enlightened self-interest. Right. So, which is for the world. Like when we, uh, vaccines, for example, you know, the vaccine Metri or uh, diplomacy that we conducted providing medicines to the world. Likewise, what India stands for? India stands for peace because peace is an, something that is absolutely essential for our developmental paradigm. So whenever there has been a conflict in the world, wherever mm. it is, mm. India has always spoken in one voice, clearly, consistently, and throughout against any kind of external intervention. And we have a history of that. Whether it was, uh, I mean, I was myself ambassador to Libya at the time when the NATO powers misused that, uh, the UN resolution, India abstained at the time. Mm. Much to, it cost us a great deal at the grassroots level. Uh, but at the same time, India stood its ground. Likewise, in the Russia-Ukraine war, what do we want, mm. essentially? We want peace, we want dialogue, we want diplomacy, we want the UN Charter to be respected, for which we have been the founding members. So, essentially, what we are looking at is that every country's land boundaries, territorial integrity, sovereignty must be respected. Must be res so, the, the <coughs> notion that we are actually partisan or not, a, not on the right side of history, as some critics say, is completely misguided. But actually, what we are saying is we are working towards solutions, right? And uh, we want to take a position that enables solutions. But how do we resist the pressure? I mean, this is something audiences want to know. You know, as diplomat, uh, there are always, you know, bigger players wanting us to toe their line. 
but India says no, you know, I'm going to make my own independent judgment. Dr. Jay Shankar has said, I am not going to let others play mind games on me. Correct. So how do we resist the pressure and please tell the audiences, <clears throat> give us an instance. You see, there are two things. One most important thing is who we are. We are an ancient civilization. We have a voice in the world. We are the second largest population in the world. Today we will be the number one. It will become the second largest or the largest market very mm. soon. It will become the third largest economy. So irrespective of the fact that big powers, whatever they want to say, they cannot afford to ignore India. Right. So India has its voice because it stands on its own. It wants friendship with all the countries. And that's what precisely we have. We have been able to navigate among the superpowers pretty confidently throughout. Now you see that during even the Russia-Ukraine crisis, large number of foreign ministers or the leaders came to India. It has mm. been unprecedented. Mm. They didn't go to any other country. To try and sway to our... To try and sway us. But yes. India was able to convince. Today we are members of the Quad. We are members of the BRICS. We are members of the SCO at the same time IPF and all. So we are, we are trying to be a balancing force. Right. Or a swing state in certain way. And if we can bring about peace by our efforts, nothing like it. Absolutely. So viewers, uh, enlightened self-interest uh, says Ambassador Anil Trigunayat and that's what uh, India stands for on the international stage. And there's no better example of it than the ongoing Russia-Ukraine crisis. There have been a number of votes brought at the UN General Assembly and also at the UN Security Council where we have been there has been an attempt to sway India to take a position, but uh, we spoke our own mind and we stood our ground. On this point, I have a video clip of uh, India's permanent representative to the UN, uh, Ambassador Ruchira Kamboj, talking about uh, why we voted in a certain way uh, at the UN General Assembly. Let's hear her and then continue the discussion. It is also unfortunate that as the trajectory of the Ukrainian conflict unfolds, the entire global south has suffered a substantial collateral damage. As developing countries face the brunt of the conflict's consequences on food, fuel, and fertilizer supplies, it is critical that the voice of the global south be heard and their legitimate concerns duly addressed. We must therefore not initiate measures that further complicate a struggling global economy. Mr. President, there are other pressing, pressing issues at play, some of which have not been adequately addressed in the resolution voted today. Our decision to abstain is consistent with our, with our well thought out national position. I would also quote my external affairs minister from his address to this very August assembly last month. And I quote, India is on the side of peace and will remain firmly there. We are on the side that respects the UN Charter and its founding principles. We are on the side that calls for dialogue and diplomacy as the only way out. We are on the side of those struggling to make ends meet, even as they stare at the escalating costs of food, of fertilizers, and of fuel. It is therefore in our collective interest to work constructively, both within the United Nations and outside, in finding an early resolution to this conflict." Unquote. Mr. President, my Prime Minister has said unequivocally that this cannot be an era of war. With this firm resolve to strive for a peaceful solution through dialogue and diplomacy, India has decided to abstain. Viewers, uh, people are often perplexed, why is India abstaining on a number of votes um, in the UN? And here you have an explanation of the vote by our ambassador at the UN saying we are on the side of those who are struggling to make ends meet around the world. When you have a big war like this which has had huge ramifications at the systemic level, hundreds of millions of people are, have fallen into poverty and are backsliding as a result of the food and the energy shortages which is linked to this war. So it's not only the plight of the Ukrainians and the civilians who are suffering on the battlefield in Europe, this is actually about the global south as a whole, and that's what she's saying. Ambassador, often the way the resolutions are worded, Ambassador Kamboj was saying, is not acceptable to us because that simply seems to pave the way for prolonging the war and to making it uh, you know, perpetual, which is prolonging the misery of the uh, global south. Absolutely. In fact, if you remember, in the beginning itself in February, we had said that the diplomacy was left out much too soon. 
I mean, that is something that India believes that dialogue and diplomacy are the only way. And we are not only saying in this context, if you come to think of it between India and China since Galwan it's happening, mm. we have preferred dialogue and diplomacy to going on a conflict or escalating it. So what we are saying, we practice as well. Right. At the same time here, in, in this case, India has always stood and has been a voice of the developing world. And ironically, once again, the world is standing on the same foot in my view that we are heading towards a Cold War 2.0 of a very different, very insidious, mm. very invidious kind, mm. which will happen eventually where you will see the weaponization of financial instruments, weaponization of energy, weaponization of food, and what the ambassador mentioned also, these three F crisis, which is impacting the world once again, which is just about to be coming out from the uh, pandemic, pandemic impact of the pandemic. So idea is that somehow this war should stop. And when Prime Minister said the era of war is over in Samarkand to President Putin, he clearly mentioned, and this was the openly he mentioned, which was caught by the media, but he has been telling it from day one. Right. When he spoke to President Zelensky and President Putin, and President Putin said, and as you know, within two months of the war, there was a very bright chance of the war being stopped. But there are certain countries that did not want it to be stopped. So that's the problem. And India's position has been consistent throughout. Yeah. And sane voice, I would say. And, and uh, talking of developing countries, Ambassador, it's quite interesting. I was looking at the voting pattern on all these issues. And whenever India abstains or says even no occasionally, votes no, you see that it's along with 40, 50 or even 60 countries at times abstaining, you know. So if you t take the UNGA as a whole, 193 countries, we are rarely isolated when we take this position. It looks like it represents a well thought out uh, group preference of a large number of countries. So when people say, why is India doing this or not? They are not looking at the larger picture, which is that if 38 or 40 or 58 or 60 have abstained and we are just one out of 40 or 60, then there's just no reason. You have to understand that there's a significant uh, chunk of the international community which shares India's viewpoint. Well, that is true and increasingly it has become so. But let us see that India's position has been a principled position. Mm. And that is why it does not waver under pressure. And we have seen it often on, I mean, you can see throughout. Uh, whenever we have conducted, we have been forceful, we have been straightforward, we have stood for peace, we have stood for UN Charter. The UN Charter has been violated by the superpowers all the time. Of different, uh, of different camps. Of them, camps for their own geopolitical objectives. But India has stood for the cause of peace, for the cause of dialogue and diplomacy, and the UN Charter, which is what sovereignty of all the countries, territorial integrity. When India said the territorial integrity of all countries and sovereignty must be respected, it clearly meant which is the country we are talking about. But we are about. not condoning what Russia is. We are not condoning. Absolutely. We have never condoned it. Absolutely. In fact, that's why Prime Minister said that era of war is over, to tell them. Yeah. But then the other side also is telling you that we are ready for talks. But at the same time, when you have... The, you know, in, a, in, a, in a, this kind of a scenario where a complete Western countries are just going whole hog into the war through Ukraine to defeat Russia, yeah. then obviously that kind of a situation is very difficult to control. And there is nobody is talking of stopping the war. And there's no end in sight when there's you have no that kind of approach. Yes. Ambassador Trigunaj, the other uh, issue on which India usually abstains or occasionally even does no are these country specific resolutions condemning uh, specific countries for human rights and are uh, calling for investigations or for uh, even uh, an inquiry by the ICC and all those things. So, uh, and it's not only China, recently India actually abstained on a vote uh, seeking a debate on China's uh, crimes against humanity in Xinjiang of the Uyghurs. But I saw that uh, on a range of countries, Yemen, Iran, uh, Palestinian territories, Nicaragua, uh, Venezuela, uh, closer to home, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, whenever there have been resolutions like this, either in the UN Human Rights Council or in the UNGA or in the Security Council, generally we tend to abstain. And sometimes the Western criticism is that if India is a democracy, why you don't stand for human rights, you should go for these kind of resolutions. But the truth is more complicated, right? And you were ambassador to Libya and you know what happened when in the name of human rights, uh, resolutions were passed and they were abused uh, to justify NATO intervention and even regime overthrow of Colonel Gaddafi in 2011. So uh, how, how is it that we still hear these voices when we know that the human rights itself is being weaponized and uh, we cannot be sure how uh, objective or neutral a human rights uh, agenda is? 
Well, the, this is the basic problem. I mean, India has always taken a holistic picture. And by simply condemning a country or the violations, I mean, if you come to think of Transparency International or the human rights reports, HRW reports and all, you will find the several Western countries are found to be indulging uh, in this kind of racial discrimination and violations. Nobody talks about them. No resolution is brought come, against them. Nobody brings about That's all politics. So when we see that this is political, we say that the whole idea of human rights is India respects human rights, not only of ours, but the whole world. And that's why we call it Vasudev Kutumkam. I mean, it's a very simple thing. But at the same time, what we tell them? We tell them that there should be a collaborative approach mm. so that we can talk about it, we can discuss it, rather than naming and shaming of a country. And we have seen it has happened against us also, whether it is in OIC or sometimes in the Human Rights Council. You know. So India stands for the rights of all. I mean, even in the Ukraine context, if you see how much have we every second, third day we have spoken about the human rights, humanitarian Absolutely. situation, humanitarian assistance. Crimes against yeah. humanity, we are yeah. totally opposed to them. Uh, just because we are abstaining on a vote doesn't mean that we don't care yeah. for human lives. Um, viewers, uh, to take you back to the bigger picture, India as an independent power center in the world, the way it's emerging, I want you to hear um, our External Affairs Minister, Dr. Subramaniam Jayashankar, talking about how independent-minded countries need to come forward and take the lead in a highly polarized world. Let's listen in. Necessary for independent-minded countries <coughs> to actually speak their mind, to seek to shape and influence the direction in which the world is going, because the world is getting very polarized. Uh, and it's, it's a double polarization, you know. It's a east-west polarization, but it is also a north-south polarization that, you know, the more, the richer countries, the more developed countries, they are not fully grasping how much the poorer countries are being hurt by what is happening in the world. So it is, it, it, I mean, it's a, it's a very, today it's a very stressful, it's a very unhappy world today. I mean, countries are struggling and in this, those who have the confidence, the experience, the capability to speak out, it's important that they do, that they don't go with the, with the tide, uh, so to speak. And to ensure that, you know, I, I think voices of reason, of sanity, of sobriety uh, are needed uh, at this point of time. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, I see India as such a voice. Uh, and uh, to the extent there are other countries with a similar bent of mind and who, who also would like to, uh, you know, think and act in a similar manner, I think it would be a very good thing. So viewers, uh, Dr. Jay Shankar talking about a stressful and unhappy world. And we are in one such full of crises and a uh, lot of suffering going on. And uh, it's in this kind of context where he is actually calling upon uh, independent-minded countries to uh, speak up, to take positions based on their own principles and interests, and also to come together. Um, but this, of course, very different from the era of non-alignment and all that. We are in the 21st century. Um, Ambassador Trigunayat, uh, values and interests, always there is a balancing act between the two, and Dr. Jayashankar often talks mm -hmm. about it. Now, in this case, sometimes people wonder, OK, if you take an independent position, but you need the help of certain bigger powers to counterbalance your rivals let's say China. So how are you able to have your cake and eat it too? I mean, why would the West still back India if you, there is no voting coincidence with them in the UN? You know, If you are so independent and you are not willing to be an alliance partner or not willing to become a junior partner of uh, Western democracies, then how can you rally all your forces against and counterbalance the Chinese? Aren't you making a mistake in terms of, uh, why, uh, why don't you be more real politic? So how would you respond to that? Well, this is precisely the real politic is all about. I mean, number one is, as far as China is concerned, which is going to be and will remain a major challenge for India. There may be an economic differential between our two countries, or power differential. But at the same time, as you have seen, that India has stood its ground, I mm. ball and given back to China that India is not a cake and not just Congo. And they have understood it very well. So we didn't need any other third country to help us. And I always believe that, as far as India is concerned, we need to be strong ourselves.
foreign policy wise and our external policies, domestic policies, economically, militarily and otherwise. And then we can be the beacon of hope for the rest of the world mm. who are outside the purview of these two power blocks that are emerging once again countering the other. For example, now today, I mean, it is no longer the NAM world as it used to be in 50s, 60s. Today it is a world where strategic autonomy is the key thing. Mm. And India is not the only country which is practicing strategic autonomy. If you see that large number of Middle Eastern countries which are rich, strong, want to follow the same kind of policy. They don't want to get into this. They are following activist policy to a great extent mm. because the pivot is moving towards Asia. And therefore, India has become a strategically extremely important country. Mm. Those countries would have never come to India the way in droves with their foreign ministers and they're trying to persuade India because mm. they're the largest democracy. Our word counts, our vote counts, our uh, what we say means, and we have a strong leader who, when he speaks, the world listens to him. Yes. That's why they, they in the Quad Summit, you remember when it happened, India clearly, Prime Minister Modi clearly conveyed it to his counterparts, President Biden and the other two, that this is our position and why it is our position. We are not condoning the, the Russian aggression, uh, but at the same time, the causes of that cannot be forgotten. So I think that India can, in my view, in times to come, will be able to lead this new kind of a grouping mm. called Nations for Strategic Autonomy. So, yeah, so the whole point is we have never believed in being a camp follower, uh, but uh, we have the capacity and the inbuilt, uh, you know, virtues to be a leader which will have its own followers. And of that course. is ultimately the path to becoming a leading power, as our Prime Minister says. But on the leadership point, uh, Ambassador, um, Prime Minister Modi, in the Modi era, we seem to have become more forthright in asserting our independent position. And, you know, if somebody bracketed us as pro-Western or as a pro-Chinese or pro-Russian, we actually, we don't fit any of it. And uh, as Dr. Jayashankar says, we take sides and we only take India's side. Absolutely. And on that point, I think, uh, where does that come from? I mean, we have a tradition, we have talked about even since post-independence, the post-colonial, uh, uh, the siding with the downtrodden and with the underdogs and with the global south, that is there. But in the Modi era, there seems to be an X factor when it comes to our ability to take out an independent position and uh, manage the relationship in such a way that uh, our major partners, our strategic partners still want us. Well, the thing is that with Prime Minister Modi, one thing is very important and that is that we are pro-India. That's it. India first. That is there. Now, when you begin from that premise, then obviously you are looking at every single option, whether through multi-alignments or through plurilateral arrangements mm. or others, as to what is exactly going to serve your interest the best, without giving in to others. At the same time, simultaneously, we are for following a global policy, whereby the global interests, global goods, global commons, rule of law, international law, freedom of navigation, all those are extremely important for us. Because they are important for us, they are important for the world as well. Right. So it comes from that. Secondly, I think that during Prime Minister Modi's time, the foreign policy has become far more, far more robust, resilient and result-oriented. Mm. So that is the clear difference that happens. And we have dehyphenated our policy from various kinds of postulates uh, that accompanied earlier that we were trying to be nice to this or that. Today we say what we want and we clearly stick to it. You see, I mean, 14 times or 15 times that we have voted yeah. uh, on this Security Council resolution, different or human rights or wherever, we have very clearly, consistently maintained that position. Yeah. We have not wavered from it. If it was a policy, it has evolved, of course, yeah. uh, with the war the way it has gone. But at the same time, it is for the larger good, for the larger human beings. Absolutely. And um, last word, Ambassador. The independent foreign policy cannot be sustained in this polarized world. I mean, ultimately, um, when it comes to warlike situations, even in the era of non-alignment, we had to take sides in order to protect our core interests. So if the conflicts and the divisions worsen between the great powers, let us say there's a major war in the Indo-Pacific involving China and the United States and its alliance system. I mean, can we then continue to be on the, uh, say that, you know, we are in the, fav in, in the interest of peace or I think we'll have to take a geopolitical um, call also. But if it's a war happening 3000 miles away, perhaps India, it's a European war and we don't feel the same way. But if it's going to affect the balance of power, 
I think we will approach, uh, approach it in a, with a more hard nosed way. So, I think there is still some nuance in the way we are going to approach this. You know, one thing is very clear that the, even though the war was 3000 kilometers away, but at the same time, you know, in the beginning we had a bigger problem of it bringing out our people. I mean, 22,500 students that had to be brought out. Many other countries also we assisted. We are known for these HADR measures and evacuations successfully from all over the world. So, different conflict zones. I have done it myself from Libya. So, we are we attach a great importance to that. Mm. Now, coming to our own, let's say there is a war in, uh, hypothetically, let us say in the Indo-Pacific, which appears to be gradually quite real. If mm. it happens, then obviously we have to see our interest. The China remains our challenge and China is uh, on our border creating a mischief all the time. So therefore, you'll have to see at that time what is your best option, like it was in 1971. Absolutely. We have seen what the, how the Americans behaved. So, First thing is, if your country is not there, then your policy is not there, mm. right? So your country has to be strong, has to be able to stand up and make the choices that are good for your country's security. Absolutely. Country that has to be strong and stand up for um, its values and interests, and that's what India is. Uh, viewers, uh, uh, no shame in any position India has taken on uh, any global issue in the last few years. Uh, if you actually uh, study each of these decisions, it uh, explains itself. The fact is that uh, India is becoming a major power in the world and uh, it is more uh, adamant on some things, but it's also more flexible on other things. And at the, the bottom line is uh, navigating India's rise to become uh, a leading power in the world requires this kind of uh, core inner strength. And that's what we are showing in our foreign policy. Ambassador Anil Trigunay, thank you so much uh, you. for joining thank me on so the much, show. Professor. It's been enlightening. Viewers, keep thinking about um, how countries take positions on global issues, uh, how India is different from many other opportunistic players. Uh, I'll see you again next time. Until then, take care.